The Gulf Injustice Podcast, the official podcast of Detained in Dubai with Prada Stone. Welcome to the Gulf Injustice Podcast. I'm Rada Sterling, and tonight we have the honour of speaking with Zulfi Bukhari, former Special Assistant to ousted Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, joining us now. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Bukhari, for joining us. Um, you were Special Advisor to ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan, and what I'd like to get from you is a sense of what led to the events of uh essentially him being ousted by a vote of no confidence. And and we'll talk about what's happened since then. But if you could just take me right back there so that people who don't know the story, you know, from the party's point of view, from Mr. Khan's point of view, we'd love to hear that from you. Sure. I think, you know, to, to be quite conclusive about it is that, you know, there was a no vote confidence. We believe that mainly it was an ingrown uh, conspiracy which was, uh, you know, you use the word inspired by the United States. We right. we generally we generally feel that uh, what happened was is that there was obviously Imran Khan and at the, at the time the uh, army chief of Pakistan were not seeing eye to eye on on various aspects of running the country, and uh, after that it was kind of downhill and and that led to uh, the no vote of confidence in in. Pakistan for various reasons, you know, the cipher being one of them as well. And, uh, you know, there was obviously a very uh, a demeaning language used by uh, an American official uh, kind of urging uh, the ambassador uh, to convey that, you know, that he would prefer Imran Khan to be out of government. And do you think uh, that then, was, uh, I mean, that, that he came, was that came around a day or so after uh, he visited uh, Putin in Russia. Now, do you think that, I mean, I've, I've read reports that Pakistan was taking a neutral stance and, you know, many countries are taking a neutral stance on the Ukraine-Russia issue. Um, do you think that America has just tried its best, knowing that in Pakistan it would be potentially able to inspire um, the actions that took place later? I mean, clearly they thought... You know, th this would work better for America if we can control who's in office in Pakistan. I think it works. Or I think that all works well for America or any superpower. Um, you know, if we if we try to be completely non-biased about it and non-emotional, me being from Imran Khan's party, uh, any country would like to have uh, the same sort of wavelength and the likes of them in other countries as well so that there's no... Uh, different uh, opinion. Um, Imran Khan did hold a different opinion, um, but you know, when I say that, I think he held a different opinion to other leaders of Pakistan. But if mm -hmm. you look around the region, he doesn't really hold a different opinion because Prime Minister Modi holds a sort of a neutral opinion, but he's allowed right. to flaunt his independent uh, mm -hmm. foreign policy, whereas we aren't, uh, let alone flaunt one. We're apparently not even allowed to have one. Uh, mm -hmm. So. It's, um, you know, so there's, there's two different laws for two different countries. Uh, but more so, I think, you know, uh, I I am one that also thinks that this was more of an ingrown issue. And the reason nice. I say that is that when the U.S. Uh, or any country primarily gets intelligence, it gets it from our intel, uh, right. our local intel, our local intelligence. And because the intelligence and Prime Minister Khan were, you know, the divide between them was just... Uh, expanding, um, you know, when they would, if they would kind of ask our intel and things were good, they'd be like, no, no, it's all under control. He's doing the right thing. He knows. Don't worry. But when the when the divide is so vast, then when they ask that, how is it going? Oh, he's terrible for the country. He's leading it towards, you know, God knows what, and he's anti-America and he's anti-West. And mm -hmm. you know, maybe we should think about not having someone like him. Then you start hearing those kind of that kind of language being used, and then. Naturally, if I was America, I'd be like, hold on, he's anti-America, hold on, he's anti-West, mm -hmm. let me, mm -hmm. let, us, let us, you know, uh, put a stop to this. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think, you know, you need to be fair on how intelligence is conveyed and, yes. and thought of and so on and so forth. So I think that is the accumulative thing that's happened. But the main reason was is because he just wasn't seeing eye to eye with the army chief of the time uh, when he was in power. And then that just led to numerous amount of controversies and eventually his uh, downfall as prime minister or the ousting by the no vote of confidence. And how do you think the people of Pakistan felt about their elected 
leader being ousted in such a manner where they had no control over the vote, no control over the decision? Well, I think if you look at how many people came out on the road that day, I remember mm. uh, the day after uh, uh, Prime Minister Khan was um, out of power, we were having a, a meet, a closed uh, the closed door meeting or the closed knit uh, kitchen cabinet, and um, and I said, look, you know, you're the most popular leader the country has probably ever seen. Where are the people? And we're mm. kind of just going like this, you know, people just aren't coming out. We went home. Maybe three, four hours later, we just started getting cold and people are still taking to the streets. And uh, I must say, it was a phenomenal turnout. And um, mm. since then, it's, you know, he's just gone from strength to st- strength to strength. He hasn't, he's become more popular than he has ever has been in his 30 uh, year old career. Um, right now, Imran Khan is by far the most popular leader in the country and by far the most leader, popular leader the country has ever seen. Um, and, uh, and the polls uh, this time showed uh, albeit they were rigged later on and albeit they were changed and, and manipulated uh, and the mandate was stolen. But it was evident across the board that Imran Khan was the most popular and the chosen uh, leader, even in these February 8th elections. And he, so he's still, even after everything that they have tried to do to him, he's still the most popular leader in Pakistan. Um, I I think that's been obvious and evident, and it looks to me like quite the military coup, essentially. Um, But it's it's even worse than that, because since then, since he's been ousted, they've tried to abuse the justice system, essentially fabricate charges against him to prevent him from ever being able to hold office again. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, he has about 200 odd cases on him, uh, all uh, made up, no legs to stand on sort of cases. We got bailed on even the Tosha Khanna case, which is the treasury about the watches uh, that he got bailed on yesterday. Um, So as the cases are going in the higher courts, which we're very confident of, in a way, in a Mm -hmm. way, we kind of want him them to sentence him in the in the lower courts, just so, so we, we can, can quickly appeal. get to the s- yes. s- appeal in the senior courts. And we know when it goes to the senior courts, there has to be some element of law and justice. And mm-hmm. the cases are so baseless that they'll be thrown out like yesterday's one will and so will the cipher and so on as mm-hmm. they get to the longer one. The problem is they're being mm-hmm. delayed to get to the higher cases. Um, but there's 200 odd cases. He had a murder case on him for a city that is two hours by flight away <laughs> from him. And, uh, and you know, and that got thrown out. So, I mean, it's it was unbelievable that a man has done it. But what has happened in the last few days is that six judges of the high court have written an open letter, which is uh, which is out, and they've all signed it, and they've said that we there is too much involvement of the establishments and the word they use of operatives. Uh, yes. You should show that letter on your vlog, and they've said that we've been blackmailed, threatened, cameras have been placed in our bedrooms. And, wow. uh, and and threats and all to manipulate judgments and to manipulate rulings and how a case should be run. And we're sick and tired of it. This is basically mm-hmm. what they have said. And they've appealed uh, to the Supreme Court to take action on this and this interference from operatives in the judicial system. Um, this is massive. It's huge uh, mm-hmm. that this kind of, uh, you know, that six brave judges, I must give credit to them, that they've, they've stood up after, you know, basically taking a battering uh, the justice system taking a massive battering for two years have stood up and said enough is enough. Um, so, you know, uh, do air that letter. And we're hoping um, that the chief justice of Pakistan, he's the, the sewer motive been taken now, but initially he made a commission with the prime minister and the law minister. I mean, everything they're saying is they're saying that these guys are the benefiters of it. Why would you sit with the prime minister and law minister when they're the benefiters of, of the six judges of what they're saying? So now a sewer motive has been taken and uh, we pray that the, a, a full bench is constructed and, and the hearing should be made public. You know, the hearing of mm. the full bench on this case should be public so people should know. Um, but it's 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 absolute, you know, absolute evidence that this is uh, what's been happening in the last two years when it comes to Imran Khan, his political party, his leaders, his wife uh, for his cases. Yeah, so would you say, I mean, in the same way that in in a sense we're seeing that kind of thing happen with with Trump, where he loses at the lower courts and he appeals and, you know, 
ultimately wins quite a lot of the cases against him. And I see this increasing what they call lawfare, misusing the justice system against political opponents for their benefit. Do you have faith in the Pakistan legal system that they will ultimately rule in favour of Mr Khan? We do have faith in the legal system. We have faith in the Supreme Court of Pakistan. Um, we know things here can get very tricky, and uh, but you know ultimately it's our country, and uh, if we don't have faith in it, a, a party who is who has you know bought the most amount of buy-in from overseas Pakistanis has bought the most amount of buy-in from local Pakistanis. Uh, if we you know we can't lose faith in our own system, and uh, so we know that once it gets because they're so baseless, we know that once it gets to the top. There's no way they can deny the lawyers, our lawyers, our, our legal team, uh, mm. you know, it's justice, even if it's not in its entirety, but certainly not what's going on uh, at the moment. So we have faith in what's happening. And there is a similarity with what's going on with President Trump uh, in the United States, most likely. And, you know, uh, I think at the moment you're seeing a lot around the world that, you know, the, the powers to be uh, are playing, are taking a bigger role in, in center stage role. In, in domestic politics. Mm, definitely. And uh, I understand that when Mr. Hahn was held in detention, were there any attempts to force any confessions out of him or any human rights violations that you noted? No, um, you know, to be fair, if I if I talk about Imran Khan, uh, I don't think there's any human rights violations, not that he has said. Yes, in the first, when he was in Atak, he was mistreated in terms of his He's a former prime minister. He's a taxpayer. Uh, he's a member of. He was a member of parliament. So hence, you are alert, allowed a certain category of prison where he was kept in a death cell, an eight by eight cell, which is uh, solitary confinement. Um, you know, his he was given a small little, uh, you know, mattress. You would say, mm. or not really a mattress, but a thin one on the floor. And when it rains, all the rain would come on it. Mm. And so he was treated poorly in that sense. For what what a former prime minister and a parliamentarian should be treated, but in terms of human rights abuse on him, no. But there are large amount of uh, Pakistan Tariq and South workers, leaders that have been uh, abused, uh, and you've seen many of them all of a sudden vanish, kidnapped, abducted, mm -hmm. and then turn up on television and give statements that they're leaving Imran Khan and Imran Khan is a terrorist and and so on and so forth. So why do you think they came up with these convictions? What if you look at Eight days earlier, they're standing on top of a car saying, you know, long live Pakistan, long live Imran Khan, we're with you to the end. And then all of a sudden, they don't go into a police system. See, when you go into a police system, you're still guided by some laws, you're in a prison, there's a, there's a system, and you have some form of rights. But when you're abducted, then your parents don't know where you are, your family doesn't know where you are, mm -hmm. and you're just missing. And when you're missing is when 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 it all goes down. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you reappear eight, eight days later on television saying, oh, you know, I've got it all wrong for the last 25 years of my life. Imran Khan is a terrible person. I've just realized seven days ago and uh, I want to leave this party. So we had this exodus of, of uh, leaders in our party to happen. But because the party is so strong, Imran Khan is so popular, a whole new uh, young leaders emerged um, from lawyers and from uh, society. That's interesting. Do you think that other party members were perhaps worried that uh, the legal system or even the Interpol system would be weaponized against them in the same way? I mean, you were issued with an Interpol red notice at one point, which you've since had removed. But do you think other party members were worried about the potential targeting that they might experience from this new regime? Well, they were not only worried, they they faced it. I mean, mm. I I would say I'm the lucky one that I had left Pakistan uh, maybe 10 days prior to, eight days prior to uh, Imran Khan being arrested for some business, uh, personal business in, in London and uh, and Dubai. And when I was coming back, the day before that, Imran Khan got arrested for only one day and then he got released. So when I spoke to him, when he got released, he said, don't come back. And he made me advisor to his uh, international media and, and relations and all. So I, I finished, so I stayed back, but what, the way that our workers have been targeted, they've been ran, their houses have been ransacked. They've mm -hmm. been kidnapped. They've been beaten. They've been missing. They're, if they're not found, and the, the, a lot of our leaders are had gone underground, their mm -hmm. brothers were uh, arrested or thinking. My first cousin was thrown into prison for two months, who's not even in politics. Wow. And this happened to 
thousands of people. We had 13,000 people in prison at one stage, women, children, elderly. You know, we've got we've got women in there who who are our health ministers, you know, or she's been regarded as, you know, everyone has high regard for her. One of the biggest philanthropists in, in, in Punjab, uh, an amazing can- cancer patient or health minister. She's in prison still. You know, you've had people from all walks of life. Khatija Shah, a uh, decorated uh, businesswoman with a you know designer label, was in prison for ages. Others, um, you know, that are in there still. Um, so, you know, and people were abused, their businesses closed mm-hmm. down, their 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 help or whoever, at their staff in their homes were beaten and taken. I had I had eight people of mine thrown into prison. I had some of my guards, I had some of my, my PAs and others that were thrown into prison. My first cousin, like I said, and people have faced it far worse and they still are. And people are still in hiding and they're just slowly trying to take bails and come out. You know, every single main leadership of ours was in hiding. Uh, every mm-hmm. senior role, uh, you know, you got your chairman Imran Khan in prison. You've got the vice chairman or foreign, you know, two times, three times foreign minister, one of the most distinguished human beings in, in Pakistan. No one can lay a finger on him on any form of corruption or anything of the sort. He's in prison at the moment. Uh, we've got our president uh, of the party, uh, you know, two, three times chief minister, uh, an elderly man. Uh, slightly physically on the weaker side, you know, because he's he's much older in prison. We've got our Punjab president. She's like I said, she's in prison. So on all of our other senior leadership in hiding. So you know, it's just been unbelievable uh, of what we've gone through. Yet we stuck through it. Yet we fought an election. Yet we won the election, and uh, and then it was the mandate was uh, unfortunately stolen from us in its entirety. Do you think that there's any chance that this will be reversed in the future? I think now you're seeing a lot of people raise their voice. Like these six judges, I think, have put a definitely put a ray of hope into a lot of people. And I think it's it's a drop in the ocean. You're going to see uh, that you know this. Uh, well, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg. I think you're going to see now a lot of people follow suit because you can't carry on living in this kind of society where. You know, it's just injustice is everywhere. People, you sit around in any coffee shop, any restaurant, any gathering. People are talking about Imran Khan. They're saying whatever is happening is terrible. So this, you know, it doesn't, what an election is supposed to do is bring political stability. And this election has failed to bring that political stability. So you spent billions of rupees and yet you've achieved nothing from where you were two years ago. Mm -hmm. So something will have to give at some point. And I think that's what's starting to happen. You know, things are becoming, I mean, they had the Interpol on me was on a terrorism job, that I'm a terrorist. Mm -hmm. And I have letters from the Interpol saying that we reject Pakistan's claim on what's been posted in a certificate of free because it was, and all of that. Because it was political persecution, essentially, and that, that absolutely. Kind of persecution Interpol won't accept. Yeah, absolutely. So mm-hmm. so it's, it's, it's evident. And um, I think, I think now things are starting to turn and uh, what the government is facing is a problem that they can't go out in public. They can't travel the world and call Pakistanis all over wherever the prime minister or foreign minister, or anyone goes, people have had enough, but what they're failing to do is that they're taking the country back decades. You know, remittances yes. are dropping, your, your exchange rate is going through the roof, your imports have dropped, your exports have dropped. You know, all these things, no one's investing locally into businesses. No one's sending money from abroad into real estate or businesses. So it's very hard to gain this confidence back. And it's not mm. going to happen while Imran Khan is being prosecuted in prison. Mm, there's extreme instability. It's affecting the citizens at the ground level, their income, their ability to live a normal life. But not only that, of course, when you round up political opponents to that extent and their families and friends and whomever else you deem you can arrest or you can, you know, fabricate a charge against. Ultimately, that's going to affect everyone in the country at some point because the world is small. Pakistan, you know, might have, you know, more than 200 million people, but everyone knows someone who's been affected by this in a drastic way. And I think that, you know, having your vote taken away from you and having, you know, the country sent back three decades is going to create that sort of animosity towards the current administration. And until this has been addressed 
and people are confident that this isn't going to happen again, that every time we elect someone or, or we choose who we want to govern us, you know, we can't have the military or any other person or group coming in and, and taking that away from the people. Yeah, you know, well said, absolutely. The The fact is that people are living in fear right now. You know, someone along the line, let it not be them, then their cousin or their or their family members or friends have been affected by what's happened in the last uh, two years, in particular, the last uh, six to eight months. And um, reality is, is that, you know, Imran Khan is also, you know, he's raised the most amount of money for Shokat Khanum and for Namal University. So everyone has donated to him at some point or the other. And people are living in fear that I hope my donation wasn't too big because if it flags up, they might catch me as well. Businessmen who just have invested in the country are going in and out and they're like, oh gosh, I have a picture with Imran Khan. His name is not being allowed to be taken on TV. Our names are not, where I am not, I'm not allowed on, on many channels and nor is a lot of other uh, leadership either. So, you know, th this is what we're living in. Imagine you're not allowed to take Imran Khan's name. You're not allowed to show his picture on any news channel. I mean, because essentially in, you'd be supporting 20, a terrorist group. In 2024, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, Bin Laden's picture is allowed. Yes. <laughs> you, know, you know, if you talk about Bin Laden, his picture is allowed. So go figure the the logic and the strategy that's been used in the last 18 months. I mean, it's mm -hmm. been terrible, right? At the end of the day, who, whoever was signed, whoever was assigned to rig these February 8th elections, I mean, they've done a terrible job at it, right? Because mm -hmm. they've done it. I'm not saying that any election in Pakistan has always been absolutely free and fair, but there's been an element of contentness in the public, in the people, in the candidates, mm. and in the voters. Mm. The problem with this election is that there's no element of contentment. Mm. And the problem with this election is that the way it was rigged was so abrupt and uncouth and ruthless mm. that it was that it was so obvious. So whoever was given this tasking, you know, should be sacked because they did a terrible job. I mean, they should have outsourced it if they couldn't do it. Mm. You know, they should have got someone in who rigged elections better in another country and said, come and do it in ours. Because we did a terrible job of it in this in this election in particular. Um, so whoever was in charge should really be sacked. I mean, they did a horrible job and they just made matters mm -hmm. worse for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I assume that most people in Pakistan, a large percentage anyway, would not have any faith whatsoever right now in the electoral system in the current administration or, and th this might take a long time. They might not feel comfortable to, that their vote will ever count again. You know, that something has to be done. What do you think has to be done? I mean, obviously you've said that, you know, you need to get it to the high court. Uh, you need to get rulings in your favor that will expose things. Under the current regime, there is extreme censorship that you've just mentioned. So do you think that even if you get these rulings, it's going to really get out to the people? Is there that sort of, um, drive that people will look elsewhere for this information? How are you going to get the message? Well, look, you have a large number of, uh, we have a, you know, a very youthful population of, uh, you know, majority of above 60 to 65%. And a lot of voters this time were first time voters, you know, 14 years old last time or now mm -hmm. 18 and they voted for the first time. Probably. Mm -hmm. This is going to scar them uh, mm -hmm. for time to come in their first election what was the outcome after their vote? Do you think they're going to bother in the next election saying, look, we know what's going to happen. It's obvious who's coming in as prime minister and uh, and our vote is not going to matter. So it's going to scar them for life of what's happening later on. Having said that, I mean, uh, you know, like Imran Khan has always taught us to be on the positive side and you can always overturn any odds and that's how he thrives in adversity. Um, I believe that, you know, it's never too late. Mm. You know, I think, the powers to be need to reconsider the strategy. The mm -hmm. strategy so far has go in, demolish, abuse, smash, and and everything will be okay. It, it didn't work. You know, we're two years down the road. The man he wanted to basically kick out of politics has been more is more popular than his entire career. He's a monster sitting in mm -hmm. prison right now, mm -hmm. you know, isolated from the world, but is actually running the country. You know, if you really think about it, every single mm -hmm. thing is everyone waits for what is Imran Khan going to comment on that? What is Imran mm. Khan going to say on that? Mm. So mm. in a way, you've just created a much bigger monster, a much bigger politician, mm. the biggest leader mm. uh, you have. So so the strategy hasn't worked. So how, what should they, What should be done now? What should be done is, if, if I think completely, again, non-biased, there has to be inclusiveness. 
you know, <laughs> I'm not one ever to go for any form of agitation. Uh, we need to find a way. The establishment is a reality in our country, but in the last four to five years, Imran Khan has also become a reality in the country. Mm. And the both realities do have to sit on the table and find a way forward. Our, you know, our army has maybe the highest, uh, I'm not sure of the percentage, but I'm sure it's about 35, 40% of the private sector of the entire country. Mm. They're the biggest landowners and the holders in the entire country. Uh, you know, you've got fertilizer companies, you've got cereals, you've got, you know, every grocery stores, you've got cement, you got you name it, they're involved in. So it's not something that's going to change overnight and nor should it. So what you need to do is that find that balance again. And I think it's important for the institution to gain that respect and love from the people, because I think that's the utmost important thing that the country always requires is for people to absolutely love and adore the institution like they have done for decades. You don't want that to fall at any point. Um, and at the same time, democracy is the path that Pakistan wants to go down. And there has to be, if not absolute, there has to be contentness in, in, in people's minds and, and feeling and the atmosphere in Pakistan. And that can't be done by the biggest democratic party with, with their backs against the wall. You know, the biggest, the largest, the most entrenched, the most, the largest grassroots level political party has to be brought to the table. And inevitably, what Pakistan needs moving forward is consistency. If you look around us from Bangladesh to India to Malaysia had its time and, and you know, Singapore, uh, Turkey, they all had consistency or still do. Many Bangladesh and India still do with, with the same leader, Turkey. Uh, and then in the GCC, you got monarchy. So there's consistency. You need consistency. Mm -hmm. Pakistan is not going to change with a five-year framework of any prime minister coming and let it be us or let it be them. It's going to be, you'll need some form of consistency. And that's the only way to take Pakistan back. And I will say that whatever has been done in the last 24 months has at least, at least taken Pakistan another 15 years back from where it was. And it's going to be very hard to leapfrog forward again. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the positive positivity of Mr. Khan, um, I'd like to hope that that can be done and hopefully sooner rather than later. Absolutely. I think the world moves a little bit faster now, um, as, as we've seen when it goes negative. But I think you can overcome that, and I hope you do. And uh, those who are listening to this, is there anything that they can do to help? Is it good enough that they you know, start talking about it publicly and stop being afraid. Is there any advice that you'd give to people who do support uh, Mr. Han? Absolutely. I mean, I think in particular the international community who, who support Mr. Khan, I think he's he was a brand name, you know, from his cricketing days uh, prior, but whoever has ever had any kind of encounter with him or knows about him knows that he's a man of integrity. Um, you know, there's not one blemish on him in any monetary uh, uh, you know, corruption case and everyone knows that everything against him is all made up and, and fake. Um, so I think people that know this man's integrity know this knows this man's, uh, you know, how patriotic he is towards his country, how he has been and represented his country on many fronts uh, through his lifetime, uh, you know, should speak up. And at the end of the day, it's not about being pro Imran Khan. We can have a thousand flaws in our governance, we can have done a lot of things wrong. I'll be the first to put our hands up on the way places where we had did go wrong and we need to improve. And this is a time for self-reflection in a way. But there, but at the end of the day, we are a country of 250 million people. Mm -hmm. You need to respect our vote. You need yes. to let the people choose who they want as their leader. And if he messes up, don't vote for him again. If you don't like Imran Khan buying his watches from the treasury legally and selling them off legally, don't vote for him. Mm -hmm. You can't put him in, 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 in solitary confinement and imprisonment for his life nice. on, on those basis. You just don't vote for him. I mean, mm -hmm. it's bizarre. Instead of not voting for something that he's that you don't like about him, you throw him in prison and throw 200 cases on him. Well, so that's what us, you do when us... you know when you think that you're going to lose at an election. You have to, the the only other way is to weaponize the justice system against them, to try sneaky tricks and dirty tricks, and you know put half of his staff on Interpol and intimidate and frighten the population. I think that's the only way you achieve power if you're not going to win in an yeah. election. No, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, and that's exactly what's happened. But, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, we, the people of Pakistan, 
uh, you know, all we want from the international community is for you to respect our mandate. Yes. And all we want is that we want we want to see democracy, which the West always empowers and talks about uh, mm -hmm. all the time. Why is it that a country of 250 million people is being ignored? You know, we're a very large democracy. We're a very young, uh, youthful population. I mean, that's mm -hmm. uh, an asset and it's also explosive as well. And, you know, we want to make sure that the government that comes in is mandated by the people, has the people's respect and vote so they can take tough decisions to improve the economic, the security uh, situation of our country. You cannot take tough decisions when you're stepping on eggshells because you know the public hates you. But when you go to the public because you got their mandate in a legitimate way, you can say, you voted for me. Now, trust me, I know the next 24 months are going to be very tough. I'm going to take severe decisions economically, but bear with me. I'm your leader. I'm the guy you voted for. And people will trust that. But when they hate you, then you'll take tough decisions maybe for a year. And then you'll go into a four-year election mode where you'll try to make decisions just to make sure you can try to find a way to win the next election. That's why it doesn't work. In Pakistan, you might have a five-year term if it ever fulfills itself. But after the third year, you're in election mode anyways. So you're not really doing any real work and, you know, actual making any, uh, you know, disruptive policies, which will which Pakistan so desperately needs. And how do you think the international community could help in a way or any allied nations? What's been the response from allied nations to Pakistan? I think overall, the, the response, um, to be very fair uh, and but respectfully, has been very poor. Um, it feels like Pakistan is, in a way, irrelevant. And um, and whoever our establishment and military decides, there's only one institution in the country, albeit it may be true, but the only thing we care about is what the army says. And if they said it's all good, then it's all good. And I think that's unfair for the people of Pakistan. Mm. And I think many countries who the Pakistani people love and adore um, and have such great relationships with, brotherly relationships with, in the Western countries, and we all look up, to United States for being, uh, you know, for what it's achieved of being a superpower, you know, United Kingdom always fighting for uh, various rights. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the the response has been very uh, weak. Um, mm -hmm. David Cameron, however, did give a good response when he first came in as as as, as foreign secretary. You know, when our elections happened, he gave a good statement. Um, we would hoped it would have been followed through a bit more, and um, and seeing the violations that have happened. In Pakistan, I mean, all we are asking for is just come and, and see for the proof for yourself. Just ask 20 odd seats or constituencies and pick up their form 45s and see how this, you know, this it's not even manipulated. It's been robbed. Mm -hmm. I mean, Nawaz Sharif lost his seat to our, our ex-health minister in, in prison. And the TV was showing 70% polling done and she was 50,000 plus votes ahead. So, and Calculations showed that even if he had won every single vote after for the thirty percent, he still couldn't catch up. Right, and um, and she lost nearly by a hundred thousand votes the next morning. Mm. In fact, it took like maybe forty eight hours to get that all changed and everything. And he ended up winning by like eighty ninety thousand votes. And wow. She was leading on television on all channels, seventy percent of the polling done by fifty or thousand votes. I mean, it's bizarre. So all we're saying mm. is that we would love for them to open this. Just doesn't matter about Imran Khan. Doesn't matter about us. Doesn't matter about anyone else. All we're saying is that they should look into that. Was this election democratic or not? Was it fair or not? That's all we ask for anyone in any circle, any influential circle, mm -hmm. any political stage, any political platform, seat or country. That's all we ask for is to look into our election and see that the people of Pakistan, 250 million of them, got robbed. Well said. And um, when is the next uh, most important part of the upcoming court hearings? When do you think we'll hear back on some important judgments for Mr. Han? Well, we have Eid coming now, so things will slow down. But I think just after Eid, uh, the Tosha okay. Khana one, and I think the Cypher one in the in the in this kangaroo court that is inside the prison, because mm -hmm. you know basically this fear that no television should ever capture Imran Khan's you know, appearance even because that brings in a lot of, uh, as, you know, inspiration into into the public. So they created a court within a room inside the prison where no international media is allowed. So you wouldn't be allowed. Mm -hmm. Although the court has ordered 
that press should be allowed inside. Only a handful of local press is allowed inside. Right. No international media allowed to go in. No general press is allowed to go in if they're not going to sing the song that they want sung. Uh, and so, so the Cypher case, I think, will come to an end soon. And then obviously, we'll, uh, whatever the outcome is, we'll end up appealing it. Okay, so you're expecting um, a negative result at the next one and then expecting to take it to the higher courts? From the way things are going, uh, the way that the Cypher case has been run against mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Khan and uh, our former Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're not looking that this court's going to give any form of justice. They're not even taking uh, mm -hmm. any real statements from uh, Imran right. Khan's side okay. or letting many times they're not even allowing just lawyers to speak. So, you know, we so know the, which way the, it's going, but we have hope in yes. the higher courts. Excellent. And yeah. how often are you speaking to Mr. Han? Uh, I haven't been allowed to speak to him. He's not allowed the telephone, but uh, through lawyers and family, through we lawyers. get to speak. Okay. Yeah. And, and, party, and party leaders. So we'll check in with you shortly and uh, and see if there's any updates coming soon. And uh, we'll revisit this on a regular basis, I think. It's an important issue for the people of Pakistan. But also, I think, you know, as a precedent as well, when you see a country in this sort of turmoil and the people that it's affecting, and, you know, I, I do believe that the international community, that that allies in particular should care enough about this to be, you know, promoting within Pakistan, to be encouraging them to restore faith in the people so the country's not in turmoil. I think we all have an onus to our neighbours to try to inspire that, that peace and stability. And I think it's hypocritical to criticise certain countries and then totally ignore the situation that's happening in Pakistan. I think it's really important that the international community talk about it. And I'm sure there's many Pakistani uh, nationals outside um, who are also following, you know, what you what you say in particular and wondering on, you know, how they can help, what they can do. I'm sure it's going to be the topic of discussion for years to come. And I really hope that you can get justice and that this can be overturned and faith restored. But it was just delightful to talk to you, and I will check in with you in another, another couple of weeks and let me know how the hearings go. I'd, I'd love to know. Absolutely. Thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Gulf Injustice Podcast.